best practices, showing them to practitioners, getting their feedback. We were going to exciting places like Dallas, Texas and the International Dairy Show to be able to show them the best, best practices and get feedback on them, to be able to vet it with those who would actually be using them in real time. From there, Michael Palanchar and I uh, collaborated on a small subcontract out of the NTFPD looking specifically at social media and how that fit into the best practices. And then all of these pieces came out of that project as well. So that smaller grant, this was funding graduate students, his grad students, my grad students, to be able to look specifically at food safety issues and more broadly at understanding how to use social media and how that fit in with the best practices in risk and crisis communication. And then our big grant, uh, that was a four years uh, that a few others on this call were engaged in in different parts as well. We were looking at case studies and a whole line of different food contamination issues. So looking at the peanut paste contamination, the San Lu melamine, uh, powdered milk formula contamination. We looked at, uh, this is the time when the uh, Fukushima disaster occurred. And because we had all this amazing data, the NTFPD actually paid for us to track all of the television media, all of the news coverage of what was happening. So we had this amazing data set and we were using closed captioning. So it was already set up. We could just pull the transcript. We had it set up where we could run for keywords. We could do tracking of the media. And then we would report to them anything that came up regarding nuclear contamination in food. But then we also had all of the other data surrounding that crisis. So we actually did other research with that data as it came in as well. So looking at how the news covered it, we looked at how, the, how TEPCO actually responded uh, as the, the power company that was working on it looked at the egg contamination crisis. And all of this was coming out of the same place. And the thing is, these were just the projects that I was on. There were at least three times as many that came out of it from others who were on this grant as well. And then from there, we were able to uh, get a grant from the Environmental Protection Agency that was looking again, we started off by looking at the best practices. So we took the best practices out of food safety and we put them into environmental contamination. And we wanted to see how they stood up. So we applied them to different cases and that's what I'll be talking about primarily this evening. And then from there, we did some next steps looking at how we could test those messages uh, within different contexts. So uh, before I go too far on it, I wanted to hear from some of you I know a, a number of the speakers who have come in so far haven't really come from the same environment where you're doing the, the applied funded research, you get the grant and then everything that you're working on uh, related to that ends up being a deliverable back from that grant. We're all working on other stuff too, but the more that we can fit in as a deliverable to the grant, the better, and that helps us get more. So for the, the students on the call and the scholars as well, why? applied funded research, why do it? Uh, I can start. I, I think what doing applied research, is, uh, especially in public relations research, there seems, I think there is a part, uh, article in public relations review a few years ago about uh, how the practice and the research kind of disconnected in some way and doing applied research so that our uh, knowledge about how, for example, crisis work and how crisis communication can mitigate some uh, negative effects uh, can directly connect it to the industry, how um, practitioners actually uh, do, do their job. And doing funded research, I mean, it's just, um, you have funding and it's easy to collect data to write paper. Uh, it's better for academics, I think. Helps when you can pay your graduate students to work with you on the research versus just ask them to join in. I'll, I'll chime in, Sherry. I know that um, for me, I, I, I remember in graduate school learning the famous Kurt Lewin quote, there's nothing so practical as a good theory. And you know, in my world and the way I think, 
I really feel connected to the real world and then trying to understand those patterns very much informs theory. So I don't feel like we created this false dichotomy, though I do totally see what you're saying when it's like you've got these this pressure for deliverables um, that can be that can uh, be a distraction in a way for doing the intellectual and academic work that needs to be done for promotion and tenure and this sort of thing. I've had the good fortune of not a lot, but some um, uh, National Science Foundation funding and they see the connection between the two. So that's been really great. And it really does um, amplify the learning experience for my students tenfold compared to what I do when I don't have funding. Yeah, awesome. I would I would add the answer I hate to hear, which is that uh, especially here in Australia, we're actually being really, really, really pressured to do this by and every school wants people to get funded and every school wants people to have money. And I just met with my head of school this week, earlier this week, and and basically it was like, well, look, look, there's all these opportunities. Why don't you do why don't you take advantage of this? Why don't you take advantage of this? So there's a huge push by schools. So the ability to do it makes you more employable, but the ability to do it also makes you have more opportunities as a faculty member. Mm -hmm. Sherry, I got one more that's really important, I think, right now. And that's that the more that we do and the more visible academia is in society and the tangible benefits that we provide to society are known, then the, there's more support for higher education. Uh, one of the things that we're seeing right now in Australia, and we saw it back in Tennessee and Oklahoma, when the public doesn't understand the value of higher education, because we don't make that leap, that we don't show them why critical and cultural theories matter, or why public relations or orgcom matters, then we don't have the support of the, of the citizens. And we really do need that in order for funding, as well as to be able to be listened to as experts. That's great, great points. So how do you get started? So Michael, as you're looking at this, they're putting on all the pressure. Where do you start? Well, usually what I would I tell people is, you know, work with somebody else who's done it before is the yeah. easiest thing. Find somebody who's experienced, get on the team and sort of work up through the, you know, through the mentorship process. You yeah. know, I've been on that and to really underscoring Michael's point, I learned so much about funding from an engineer at Rutgers who, you know, so don't dismiss these interdisciplinary projects where, you know, in a science like engineering, they are get funded or they don't get promoted versus we have a little bit less stress about that in communication. But, you know, he, he ended up being a really great mentor for me in learning how to make the arguments and make the case. Yeah. Money gets big, money begets money, just like publications do, right? You find someone who's really good at, if you wanna publish well, publish a lot, find someone who writes really well and gets a lot of publications and write with them, learn to write like them. And the same is true for getting grants, work with someone who gets grants. And that first one that I showed where our project was only 60,000, but the whole grant was 1.25 million. So I can say that as a graduate student, I was on a $1.25 million grant. Now, I didn't see <laughs> most of that money, but I can add that on. So when I'm applying for a grant, I can also show that, look, I've done this. I've continued to get grants, which means that I've been successful. And that's usually what it comes back to too, being able to show that you get funding from sources that you've gotten funding from before demonstrates that you're being successful in that process and you can get more. So we talked about some of the pros about why to do it. Why not? What are the cons to doing applied funded research? <laughs> Marine. <laughs> well, uh, you get stuck doing a lot of paperwork in an administration. So uh, especially if you don't have a, a full-time manager or a part-time manager, uh, if you don't have a supportive uh, institution that has a, a grant team that can do budgets and all of that. And I've watched people at other universities really struggle to write a large grant. I remember early years at Rutgers, Susan Morgan, she did everything. And now universities, if they're smart, they hire a professional team of people who really will help and do the budget and come up with, like I remember just trying to figure out how much does a graduate student cost? And then I'm like, what? They cost that much? 
wow, that's a lot of money. So I would say that there's a, um, an added administrative. There's also an added time because you have to have grant meetings. You need to keep and coordinate your team. There's reporting. So I, I do believe there's a lot of invisible work that falls on, especially if you're young and early in your career and you don't know all these things or your budget's quite small. So I think there's a lot of work in the beginning. Yeah. Working with others who know what they're doing helps. Mm -hmm. uh, having to do just a small chunk of it. Uh, when I was on the grants, after, after I was graduated and off on my own out of university, my job was to oversee the graduate students. So uh -huh. I took them for hours. I made sure that they got those all submitted. I approved all their hours. I made sure that they were where they were supposed to be. So there was even that when I was just in a small piece of it, it still ends up being more time, but you can do so much with it too. So you mentioned Susan Morgan. One of her graduates is a faculty member at Kentucky and I was just going through her dossier. They had 12 publications last year out of their little research team. So it's, um, you can produce a lot of work when you have the money to be able to support all of that research. All right, so I'm going to move into grounded theory and best practices. So grounded theory is used widely in communication, uh, particularly useful in developing generalized standards and principles, especially when an area is new. So figuring out what is the best way to do something when it hasn't been done for very long. And we can think that, oh, well, crisis communication is going on a long time. Really, from an academic standpoint, probably the first classes were maybe late 90s, early 2000s, and so maybe 20 years. And you know, I'm looking at Elvin, 20 years is a lot in your life, but it is much less uh, in academia as a whole. It's a, it's a burgeoning area still. Uh, grounded theory is typically inductive. You're trying to understand a phenomenon by describing those patterns that you see. And then you can explore those categories in other contexts. So like us taking the best practices out of food safety and moving them into environmental studies. So the best practices specifically were practice driven. Best practices specifically are practice driven, but they can also be grounded in systematic research and theoretical approaches. So you'll see some of that come in as well when we bring in the literature as well as what we're hearing from the experts. Uh, the key thing is that different contexts are different and you have to be really careful about trying to apply something from one industry to another. So anytime we're moving best practices around and thinking, oh, well, we can just dump it into another area, you can actually uh, make things much worse. So you have to be really careful on that process. And I think the key is that you keep that in the back of your mind, but if you don't try it, you aren't gonna know to see how they apply elsewhere. So the best practices in risk and crisis communication really came out of the work of uh, Vince Cavello, Peter Sandman, and Matt Seeger, and Barbara Reynolds, who is the head of communications for the CDC at the time that these were being developed. And then we were doing research with the National Center for Food Protection and Defense. And then for me, as a graduate student at NDSU on the risk and crisis communication project, because we were doing all those food safety case studies. And really with the best practices, it was just in conversation. So for the NCFPD, we brought all of these experts into a room. We started with Covello's, Covello's seven best practices and then just started expanding it from there. So having conversations about what works and what doesn't work, put together uh, an initial list of those best practices, sent it back out to the expert panel. And then that initial publication that Seeger had was in, if you are interested in the best practices, get the whole issue of the Journal of Applied Communication Research uh, in 2006 where the best practices are featured because in addition to Seeger's article, Keith, Reynolds, Ropeek, Sandman, and Bennett all wrote uh, criticisms of it and uh, asked additional questions and added some things that I think Heath called his quibbles that he had with the best practices so that it was an ongoing conversation. Ultimately, what came out in that article were these 10 best practices. So just to go through some of these and how they're, how they're used is looking at planning those pre-event logistics. So this would have been putting together your crisis communication plan, getting everything together, coordinating networks. So knowing who you're going to need to rely on in a crisis, 
who are your partners in that response process and make sure that you have those networks set up ahead of time. Uh, accept uncertainty. Uh, this is a big part that really went back and forth and it was really hard when we went to practitioners because they did not want to accept uncertainty. You shouldn't communicate unless you know what you're talking about, unless you know what's happening. Well, our argument comes back with, think of an example of um, a semi is going down the road, it tips over, people stop, they can smell something, their eyes are burning, there's a noxious cloud in the air. Do you wait to find out what the chemical is? Or do you put out the announcement that, that avoid traffic in that area? Do you do a shelter in place in the homes in that area so they're not bringing that noxious gas in? Even though you don't know what it is yet, you still need to put out those warnings. So that was where the argument came for accepting uncertainty. With the proactive strategies, it was forming partnerships with others in that response process. So if you are working with the CDC, you should be partnering with Health and Human Services within your area or within your jurisdiction. Listening to public concern, if um, there are complaints coming in, if people have questions, that you're actually getting that information in. Being open and honest uh, is set up as a best practice and that shouldn't have to need more explanation, but sometimes it does for our practitioners as well, just on, well, you don't wanna tell the public more than what they absolutely need to know. Well, if they find out later that you withheld information, that makes you liable for any injury that was caused to them because of that information you withheld. For the strategic response, you need to be accessible to the media. Uh, in some cases, this was challenging for the practitioners as well, particularly when we were going out into the agricultural context, we would be meeting with extension agents. And we asked, well, what do you do when a reporter calls? And it was let the answering machine get it because they didn't want to answer. <laughs> they didn't want to respond. Well, that's not going to help the message because someone else is now going to control that crisis narrative and you're not part of the conversation. You need to be able to communicate compassion, especially when people have been injured or killed, depending on the situation. Provide self-efficacy. Uh, this one has kind of gone back and forth a little bit too. Just the idea of need to be able to tell people something that they can do to protect themselves is where it ultimately, ultimately comes down to, what it ultimately comes down to. That you need to tell them what they can do so that they feel confident that they can do it so that they can protect themselves in the midst of a crisis. And I'll talk about that more as we look at some of these different cases. And then the last one is to continuously evaluate and update crisis plans. If you put together a crisis plan and you put it on the shelf, it really doesn't do any good so that you're making sure that you're reviewing it and going through it again. So these were the original 10 best practices. Uh, then Selma and Vidaloff did a study, they were looking Initially, they were working with Native American communities. They had also worked with Hispanic communities that were in meat packing plants. Uh, the turkey processing plant was another group that um, a few of our other colleagues were working on. So they added in another best practice, which was to acknowledge and account for cultural differences so that as you're planning for your crisis response and implementing it, that you're considering the cultural differences of your stakeholders and making sure that you are providing information in the right way for their background. Now, I mentioned that grant that Mike Palantar and I had, so it's just a small grant, and our focus was to look at those best practices and really figure out how that applies to social media, or more the other way, how social media can help us better use those best practices, how they can work together. So, Ultimately, what we found, we would go through, and this was all literature. So we combed through the literature. We looked at popular press work. We were, looked at the, um, the journal articles, pulled everything together to be able to better understand how it's being used, and then how did it fit within the best practices. And what we came up with were a, a list of recommendations. So you need to determine social media engagement as part of crisis management policies and approaches. So there are some companies that if you're in crisis, you don't use social media at all. No one's supposed to be on social media because they could say something that could get them in trouble. Well, 
the alternate side of that is if you aren't communicating on social media, then you're missing a whole audience, right? And another focus was incorporating social media tools for environmental scanning. So we talked about the importance of listening to your public. Well, listening on social media is a great way that you can listen to your public and find out what's going on and what they're saying about your brand or your organization or your institution. Engage social media in daily communication activities. This was key that in the middle of a crisis is not the time to start your first Twitter handle, right? Should be ongoing. You should already have followers because if they're not following you, then it doesn't matter what you're putting out on social media. You have to have those relationships already built. Join the conversation, including rumor management, and then determine the best channels to reach your segmented public. So if you hear something out there that's being said about your organization or being said about an issue that's happening in the history, industry and it's not true, correct it in real time. And that's something you can do in social media. Check all information for accuracy and respond honestly to questions. So a few of the cases that came up as we were going through the literature were examples of organizations that would forward information that they haven't fact checked, which now they have hurt their credibility uh, with their social media followers as well. Follow and share messages with credible sources. So as I mentioned, uh, it's important to have be a partner with Health and Human Services if you're working for the CDC. Well, if there's a middle of, you're in the middle of a crisis, you should be tweeting each other's messages, right? Demonstrating that you're working together and that you have this relationship as well. You need to recognize that the media is already using social media. So if you're not on there, it, you're missing that huge group uh, who would be talking about your brand or your organization. You need to remember that social media is interpersonal communication. You can't continually put out these marketing statements that actually has to be a conversation and your social media should have a personality and anyone who is in charge of your social media should be using that same personality as they're communicating for the brand or the business ask for help and provide direction uh, you can refer to others and uh, also reach out to the public to ask for help. So this is the piece of partnering with the public and engaging them, something you can do quite easily through social media. But ultimately, it is not the end all be all. Social media is not a best practice. It is a tool that allows you to meet those best practices in risk and crisis communication. And I put the note here on how this uh, study has gone out. So we put this one out in 2011. And again, it was a literature search, but it was pulling in social media to the best practices. And we've had 680 citations of that study that was applying social media to the best practices. And the original piece back in 2006 uh, is only about 100, or 100 more uh, over the course of those years. So adding in the focus on social media and who's talking about social media, ultimately we ended up in some ways creating best practices for social media. And that's how they've been spread out through the literature. Keep in mind, this is nowhere near Kenton Taylor's 1500 citations for dialogic theory, which we cited in our social media paper. But just to show you that for the grad students out there who are thinking about publications and getting their name out there and getting their research cited, um, sometimes it depends on the, the content and how you're using it more so than the, the actual literature you're bringing in. It's been 22 years also. Yeah, well, <laughs> we're at nine, but still. <laughs> All right, so a little bit of discussion. So if I can bring in some other folks here too to talk, how can the best practices be used in the crisis planning process? So looking at those 10 or 11 best practices from before, how would you use those, those as an organization if you are writing your crisis communication plan. Maybe as an evaluation tool, like um, we write our plan and then and double check with those guidelines and best practices to see if we have considered uh, all the, uh, all aspects. Yeah, evaluate the plan as you're writing it. I really like the part about um, 
can I consult with people and, and listen to people and uh, it, it would be good to integrate them into the process of creating the crisis plan so they they engage and they know also what to do and what to expect when things happen or you know things go wrong I really like this part I think it was very good Similarly, right, you can't do a crisis plan without in, in working with a lot of people beyond the communication function in an organization. So ensuring that people, e even if the, the PR folks understand most of those practices, they, they don't necessarily, uh, you know, they have to work with a lot of people who don't. <laughs> and so selling things like uh, accepting uncertainty, if you have a guideline that says, this is what we need to be doing, that helps a lot to get buy-in from the rest of the organization to create an effective plan. Yeah, you can give them a one-pager uh, saying, these are our best practices. From the communication standpoint, this needs to be included in our plan as well. It's a very good uh, idea to use the practices from other organizations, uh, how, mm -hmm. how other organizations handle the, the, the similar crisis. Yeah, especially if you're if you're new to the organization too, for you to be able to rely on someone else and bring all of that literature in. Yeah, or, or just to evaluate some sources of information which 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 might happen in other country as a as a period, as a as a as a time, as an age. And you know and again, from stress, stress, stress analysis also. Mm -hmm. That's the we the, the crisis arised from 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 certain uh, problems, certain issues which uh, actually uh, our our or other organization live live within. So so if if we know how to handle uh, threats, uh, so we 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 know how to to handle crisis actually. Yeah, and that's part of this too is that they were originally set up as crisis best practices and then adding in risk and crisis best practices since it's supposed to be a holistic process, not just in responding to the crisis, but how do you prepare? How do you build that plan to prevent a risk from becoming a crisis? And if you're communicating in these ways and in inclusive ways, you're less likely to end up in a crisis even if you have a threat for your organization. And I was just thinking that um looking through my practical experience as a public relations practitioner, that's kind of the language practitioners speak. They very much think in terms of best practices, okay, what everyone is doing, why they're the best, how can we do this? I'm just realizing that that's exactly how it works. <laughs> so yeah. if we're using I also, it, go ahead. Sorry. Uh, I also want to double down on uh, Luke's point about um, building uh, kind of like, like a relationship network beforehand. And uh, he, he mentions how you should also uh, build a good relationship network within you know, the employee community, how um, PR department and other departments should communicate beforehand. And also like at different levels, the network, for example, into organizational network compared to my practical work back in China before I came to the study here, like back there, we will focus a lot on um, like government uh, corporate uh, relationship and building but here like you are uh, have a lot of NGO that if you are in the food industry then there are a lot of NGO you have to um, deal with first so if crisis and some risk happen and you have some resources to go to and those relationships will not come right away you have to build it so it's a part of the crisis planning as a from a network perspective, you have to build uh, macro level organizational networks, but also build networks within the company uh, with different departments. Yeah, just like the in the middle of the crisis isn't the first time that you should be working in social media. It's not the first time you should be talking to those NGOs who you need as partners. You know what I just realized? I, I'm, I'm just curious if there's research um, out there like this, that um, th one of the insights you had that um, work together with others who also share credible information about the crisis. And I'm just curious how many of the like airlines and, you know, food companies, you know, all those uh, companies that are very much um, 
subject to crisis, how, ma how many of them follow on social media, CDC, you know, F FEMA, 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 that's how I say it. I mean, all those companies that also spread credible information. I was just, if there's anything like this, I think it would be interesting to see. Yeah, I think uh, watch those those Twitter feeds a little bit when you when a hurricane hits uh, in an area. See how many of those businesses start retweeting uh, tweets from NOAA or from FEMA. You'll see there they have that partnership piece on the social media side. Those who are doing it. <laughs> so, how can best practices be used in the evaluation process? So, the crisis has occurred, and what many in the organization would prefer to do is, okay, shoo, we got through it. Let's never talk about it again. But you can't, or they shouldn't. So how can you use those best practices in evaluating after a crisis has occurred? Oh, well, you, you know, evaluation is, is, is uh, always a a problem in, in in public relations because you know it it is, it is uh, pretty difficult to to uh, to show to like to measure the impact of, of communication efforts, especially in crisis communication when everything is uh, is uh, is under attack and uh, and and ev 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 everyone is rolling uh, rocking and and so on. So so that's uh, that's a huge problem. So. But from other side, again, if we have a good, good example, good practice, which we, which we can show to, to management, because I, I, as well, I, you know, I'm I'm not very you like normal professor. I, I'm just I'm I'm young professor. I'm just just started because I came from practical point of uh -huh. view, practical field. So so usually usually. People rely on on someone else's uh, experience. In in our culture, we always like to 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 study uh, someone else's errors, mistakes. Yes, so that's that's a good good proverb. No, nobody follows this uh, rule, but but everyone likes to 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 talk about it. So so if we can uh, show that. As the organization had this, those bench, benchmarks, those indicators of effectiveness, efficiency, so so it 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 might help uh, us in in this uh, project as well. You know, that's a it's a really good point from the standpoint of if you're a if you're the head of communication and you wanted them to follow those best practices and build them into the plan, and there was some hesitation on that. If a similar organization in your field has gone through a crisis and you can go through and apply those best practices and look at what they did well and what they didn't do well, it's so much easier to evaluate someone else's mistakes than your own. But that would give you an entrance point to then get those best practices into your plan as well. So again, if you're looking at it the cyclical standpoint, if you've built them into your plan, it's much easier to be able to evaluate your plan based on whether or not you met those best practices because you already knew that those were going to be the evaluation measures you were going to have to look at. Yeah, and, and that they succeeded. That's, that's right. again, very important. And, and also, I mean, setting aside budget money for that and stuff, making that part of the plan so that after the fact, you're not fighting to say, we need to evaluate this. It's like, we're done now, let's look at it. And we've got you know, an expectation that we're doing that. So what are the dangers or limitations of relying on best practices? One that I can think of is that, one that, one that of is that um, you don't know the specifics. Like you don't know the resources they had. You don't know the target audiences they had. You don't know, um, you know, like the, the, the um, you know, that kind of the, the professionalism and, and what they already had before. So it's very, um, not abstract, but it's very, um, it's not very detailed. I mean, it's not very co contextual. So you can, you can, you, you can take it and, and, and you can try to learn from this, but you don't know what exactly happened over there and kind of the specifics and how it can limit you in, in, in applying those practices. Yeah. And pl plus people are usually uh, when they, describe the cases of like writing about it or making speeches, they usually 
using only those aspects of, of campaign which were, were positive. Right. Usually people do not don't like to 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 uh, to discuss their pitfalls and that's mm -hmm. uh, that's mm -hmm. true because for example I, I have a course of crisis communications in my university and we are always you know uh, inviting practitioners from different organizations about tell something about crisis communication everyone likes to to say about uh, how they plan how they evaluate blah 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 but nobody wants to say about their fails they you know, they say oh well we, we we don't we we are prepared but we didn't have uh, actually the, the good crisis and, and we didn't fail so that's i think we do the opposite and as academics we only look at the failures because that's the only thing we know about if they succeeded we don't know that they succeeded so we have all of these cases of failure and that's the only thing we're looking at as far as how we can prepare and plan. But either way, we see this in the uh, uh, resilience uh, research on the organization side is the really the flawed thinking when we think we're being very rational and we use best practices, which end up boxing us in and going to what Anna said regarding, you know, we, we fail then to see what's unique about the particular situation. And so, you know, in, in my work in resilience, we start thinking about those sorts of needs for, yes, you need to have the plan in place. Absolutely. Yes, you need to have best practices in mind, but yes, there needs to be flexibility. And, and you know, I've been writing a bit about the importance of autonomy that you trust your employees who have their boots on the ground to actually recognize when it's time to, you know, to follow policy or past practices versus being improvisational and transformative about what had been done in the past, because most crises have unique qualities that past practices don't quite necessarily match up with. And so it's, it's fun to see the connection between the external performance of the internal decision-making that comes you know, behind the scenes from the public relations practices. Absolutely. And you have to think too of just, you can plan, you can have this great plan in place, something can go wrong and you can handle it perfectly to your plan. But then it was a slow news day and there's nothing else really going on. And suddenly your story takes off and that's, that's where you are. So every crisis is situational and it's making sure that just as you would look at a crisis communication plan, you don't follow the plan step by step by step. It is a guide, which is why exercising the plan is so incredibly important so that you can learn how to improvise and adjust as you go through in the crisis. So the next area that I wanted to talk about today, um, Michael and Maureen and I had had a conversation a while back just on um, case study research and how that's done and how things fit in. So I thought I would bring that in because that is my primary uh, method that I use. So I wanna start there. Is case study research real, res real research? And who are the naysayers and why is it cut down? And is there anyone on here who has not heard some kind of negative comment about case study research before? A little bit, right? You hear the, the comments, it's soft research, it's not real research. I, you're not doing survey, you can't generalize from what you're finding. So it's not real research. Go ahead, Michael. I live with Maureen Taylor, so I hear this all the time. <laughs> Maureen, you wanna be a naysayer on it? Is case study research real, real research? One case study probably is not enough, but a series of case studies, I think, provides deeper and broader insights. But yes, of course, a case study is a, a valuable piece of understanding a larger picture. How's that? Can I be the, I'll, that's me being the other side. How's that? <laughs> you can be both, yes. Actually, I mean, yeah, I actually agree. I actually also think that definitely case studies has value. I mean, you see like it, there are different ways to conduct a case study. So it's not the case study per se, which is bad, but just there are some studies who used case studies and those are not very good. But actually you can use a case study with multiple methods and kind of, you know, um, describe, describe the, describing the context and the situation and the complexity. So it can be very valuable. So it's not, 
there are bad ones, but I think most of them are, are still good. <laughs> So the boundary conditions we draw around it, Maureen and I started our careers based on some might call it a single case study of um, uh, transformation, and yet we consider it a very deep field research project. So it, it, you know, it depends on the boundary conditions you set too on the case, and what what are you trying to what are you asking, and what answers are you trying to glean from that case? I think are really important. They're, that's a really great question, though, about um, whether it's legit. Yeah. And there's a lot of illegitimate case study research out there. I mean, sloppy research, right? The teaching case studies where you're using this, oh, let's talk about this case study, but really all you're talking about is an example and you haven't done the thorough research behind it. Uh, <laughs> actually, the, the last page conference I was at, I was, this was right after uh, Nike had come out with the Colin Kaepernick ad and the guy got up on stage and he did, he was talking about a bunch of other things, but he said, so let's look at this case study. And he went off on this whole thing about how awful and wrong Nike was to use Kaepernick because there was social media was blowing up because people were lighting their shoes on fire. And there's a good chunk of us who do crisis communication in the crowd and we're like, no, no, no. Like he had, he had to take steps back because we're all like, this is not gonna turn out bad. You are making this case study judgment way too early. Give it time. So sometimes we use them as, we call them case studies, but they're really examples. And you can't generalize statistically from a case study, obviously. It is bound by the case. You can generalize the theoretical findings to see how they would apply elsewhere. And I think that's the key thing to look at with case studies. So when I'm looking at case study research, it is not dependent on a single method. It is not a case study of only looking at media coverage and nothing else. Uh, sometimes it's qualitative, it's interviews, it's focus groups, textual analysis, sometimes it's quantitative. I do surveys as part of case study sometimes. Sometimes you're doing ethnography where you're actually in the organization or in the situation. Uh, I look to, I think it was Selnow and Almer and Littlefield who had done the, the study of the floods in Fargo, North Dakota. They were literally lifting the sandbags onto the dike. So they were in that experience as well. It can be any mixture of the methods. It can be a single case, but it can also be multiple cases. And for me, the kicker is that people uh, put little digs here and there on case study research, but there's a ton of research out there that is never labeled as case study research. And it absolutely is just that they're looking at a bounded case. They just aren't calling it a case study. If you're doing focus groups of people who have been evacuated following a specific hurricane, you're doing a case study on how people were evacuated of that hurricane, but we don't talk about it in the same way. So we're looking at that bounded context. So when you use a case study is when you're trying to understand the how and why. How did this happen? Why did this happen? When you're looking at theoretical propositions that, is, that are guiding your data collection and your analysis, perhaps in a crisis when you have very little control over the events, it's not like we can go through and set up control certain variables in the midst of a crisis. When there's multiple sources of evidence that would be required in order to triangulate what's happening, when the focus is on something that's in the news right now in a real life context while the crisis is occurring, if you're gonna collect that data as it's happening, you're doing a case study. And that's an important question. Those are important questions that need to be answered. And then when those contextual conditions are pertinent, when it is specific to that hurricane, not just all hurricanes across. You're not just interviewing people who have ever been evacuated from a hurricane. You're asking about that one hurricane and that context is important for what you're studying. So the purpose and goals of case study research, you're trying to illuminate a decision or a set of decisions, why they were taken, why they were made, how they were implemented and with what results. So your goal is really to establish those lessons learned. What can you learn from this case? You wanna offer practical recommendations to those in the field. 
and ideally to expand and generalize theory. So you're not generalizing your findings, you're generalizing those theoretical implications. Quality case studies still have construct validity, internal validity, external validity, and reliability. Anyone should be able to take your case, look at your case evidence, and be able to understand how you link that evidence together to be able to make those connections and provide those findings. You need to be able to establish those causal relationships between the evidence. And you need to have that domain set for generalization. How does it fit? What context are you looking at? And where else can it move in those different areas? When you're doing data collection, from my standpoint, is that you need multiple sources of evidence. And those multiple sources should converge on the same findings. You need a database of evidence that is separate from your final report. That means every article, every report that you pull together, every interview that you pull together has to be kept separate. And then you draw the evidence together to make, be able to make those connections, create that chain of evidence for your case. Oh, I got bombed. You taking care of it, Michael? Yeah, <laughs> uh, I'm better right now. It's the second person. I'm going to stop admitting. Uh, I'm not, does anybody know Michael Blake? Uh, can I actually follow up since he's getting rid of our friend? Uh, yeah. So you said keeping everything separate. So yeah. can you explain a little bit more? So does that mean that you would you would take your interviews and keep them separate? And then you would take your media content analysis and keep it separate. Can you tell me a little bit more about how you how you do that and how it stays separate? So then when you draw the case study together, how you do that? Yeah. So what I do, I'm working on a case study right now. So I have all of the media. All the media coverage is in one area. I have all of my interview transcripts are in another area. And then I, I'm building in the reports that are coming out as well as the news releases that are coming out from the organization. So I have them all pulled together and the citations are there and I don't know what all I'm going to use yet. So when I'm describing what was included in a case study, I include what, what I actually used to describe the case. So when I actually cited something in my description of the case, that's when I bring it in as my description of the data that was included. It's not just every single thing that I looked at throughout the process because I'm only, I'm only citing, I'm only including in the ultimate evidence that I use in my argument, what I pull from later. So I keep that full chain of evidence or all of the evidence that I collect in one area and it stays there. And then I have a separate form or a separate document where I start pulling stuff together as it fits and ties together and something that's not duplicated that I'm using a unique source to better understand what's happening in the situation. So that's how I do it. Um, I build all of the, the evidence first. And then if I find something in the process so I'm reading an article and it links to another article that I didn't have in the evidence before. I'll go and get that article, add it to the full group, read through it, and then decide what does or doesn't fit. I think the big thing is that you're not going through and writing a summary without pulling that evidence in. Does that make sense? Does that? Yes, thank you. All right, so I'm gonna go through um, one, well, one study, multiple cases, just to go through how we ended up using the best practices. And I may skim over some things just so we can get to more discussion pieces, but I wanted to be able to at least go through a couple examples of cases that we've examined. So the multi-case analysis, we are looking at five distinct environmental crises and this was the, the grant that was funded by the EPA. And it was a two-part study. So the first part, uh, the area that I led was the, the case analysis. And then once we were done with the case analysis, we took those best practices, created vignettes that were then tested out in focus groups so that we could apply them and see how they actually stood up in conversations after uh, outside the case. Uh, we tried to cluster the information as it was coming in. We wanted to conceptualize all of the information we brought in for the cases within those underlying within the underlying construct of the best practices. So it wasn't like we went into the case inductively 
looking to find something, we took the best practices and we applied them deductively to the cases. We were looking for evidence of adherence or diversion from the best practices. So what did they do looking at those set of decisions? What did they do? How did they respond? What was the result? Did that align with the best practice or not? So that was the first part of it. Evidence in each case was then analyzed to identify any challenges that didn't fit in the best practices. So now we went back after we had categorized everything. So we had the evidence there, what fit, and then we had all of this stuff that didn't fit, but were still problems in their communication in the crisis. And then we looked for uh, comparisons across those five cases to see if there are things that were similar or things that would make sense in those other cases as well. And those challenges were compared, consolidated, categorized across, and then we added additional guidelines to the best practices. And I'll go through those at the end. So we are going to start with uh, the first case is the Canadian Pacific Railway derailment. And this occurred in January 2002. It was uh, near Minot, North Dakota, where it was below freezing temperatures already. And when the train derailed, it released 290,000 gallons of anhydrous ammonia. If you're familiar with this at all, anhydrous ammonia is uh, linked to water. So for a human, it tries to suck all of the water out of your body. So your eyes are burning, your throat is burning, your skin is burning from this noxious cloud that's hanging over. The issue is that this happened one uh, in the middle of the night and the trigger that would have gone to their emergency alert system failed. They also only had satellite music playing. They did not have the emergency broadcast system failed. Uh, TV was off unless it was cable. They didn't have a way to break into the cable network at the time. There was uh, two and a half hours after the train derailed, big loud noise, people go outside and they can't breathe. And they called 911 and they got a busy signal because they only had seven lines and those seven lines rolled over to four administration lines. So if they didn't get a busy signal, they got hung up on so that the operator could get an open line in order to call an emergency response. So as this uh, crisis occurred, we looked at the, the case evidence that we specifically looked at to examine this case. We had interviews with the EPA onsite coordinator. Uh, we also interviewed Clear Channel communication spokesperson since it was a big part of it was the radio response. We looked at 22 news stories and the railway accident report from the National Transportation Safety Board. So this was the case evidence that we pulled together to better understand this case. We then looked at what they did well, what they didn't do well. So some of their strengths were aligned with planning and preparedness, that the EPA and local officials had an established crisis network. They did meet the needs of the media when they finally figured out what was going on and the media started making calls. They were open and honest about their response. And we, the response we looked at as the, the, those in charge was the city because it was emergency management that needed to respond initially. And they provided messages of self-efficacy when they got through to people. The messages that needed to go out was to shelter in place, to turn on the water in your bathroom, to put a towel under your door because that's how you would dissipate that gas. And the problem is that they couldn't get the lines out for two and a half Sorry, hours for people to get messages. Yes. Uh, who who judge the, those strengths and weaknesses? You or or those uh, respondents from the company? So this was how the the case study analysis was done. We had a team of we had a team of ten. Uh, each group uh, had each case had two individuals, and then we all came together as we were going through the assessment. So these were all individuals who were very well steeped in the best practices. We're doing the same kind of analysis for their cases. And then we would have discussions over what they did well, what they didn't do well, according to the evidence that we had. So as each of us would come in with, all right, this is what we found, what they did well, what they didn't do well, then the rest of the group would be able to come in, ask questions, double check what was happening until we agreed that these were the right, right responses. 
So it was part of that grant team that was reviewing everything. Failures in the process was a failure to acknowledge uncertainty about what was actually happening. The other challenge was that this was January of 2002. If you've ever been to Minot, North Dakota, the only thing in Minot, North Dakota is an Air Force base. And it's also the location of where our nuclear warheads were located. So 2002, after 9-11, 2001, those who heard the crash and the, the noxious air assumed that we were being attacked. And being able to respond and deal with that uncertainty was, uh, the police department didn't respond to it very well. The mayor didn't respond to it very well, nor did the emergency managers. Uh, there was a lack of compassionate communication. One individual died because he was trying to drive and the, the vehicle, um, same thing, tried to suck the moisture out with all this anhydrous ammonia. Uh, he ended up crashing and dying in his car of asphyxiation. I can't say that right now. He choked to death uh, from the anhydrous ammonia. And they, they lauded themselves as a city because only one person died. And meanwhile, there were dozens of people who continue to this day to have respiratory issues because they were out in that cloud. Uh, they also didn't go through to evaluate and update their plan and didn't account for cultural differences in their instructions after. So their big plan for how to make sure this doesn't happen again was they provided shelter in place guidelines in the phone book. And that was their checkbox for, for how they responded well to updating their plan. So there are a lot of challenges that happened in here. And here's the key thing, as I go through some of these cases, this part of the presentation is the part when I'm reviewing an article where I say, this is great. I learned a lot about a, a train derailment. I learned nothing about communication. And that's my, my biggest criticism of case studies when they focus so much on the case that they never get to the point of actually assessing the communication and helping us learn more about communication. So I'll breeze through some of these a little bit more, uh, but I just wanted to kind of give you an idea how we went through this process. Uh, the next case that we looked at, because again, we were trying to come up with a variety of environmental contamination cases. We looked at the post-Katrina travel trailers. So this is after Hurricane Katrina, you had, uh, it was almost 150,000 people who were displaced and put into mobile homes uh, around the Gulf region. Well, as months went by, uh, people started having trouble breathing. And the Sierra Club actually had gone out and tested some of the trailers because people kept complaining about having trouble breathing in their trailers. And it was, no, no, everything's fine. Well, then they did tests and they found that there were elevated formaldehyde levels in these trailers. And this occurred, so keep in mind that Katrina was in 2005. It was in 2006 when the Sierra Club did the tests. And it wasn't until 2008 that the CDC finally returned their tests that showed that the formaldehyde levels were four to 10 times higher than what is uh, allowable in a, a normal home. Uh, it's also to the point of what um, embalmers would be dealing with on a daily basis and people were living in that 24 hours. And it wasn't, they actually made the recommendation in 2008 to remove everyone from the trailers. And the last trailer didn't get removed until 2012. So you think of all of those years, that's six years from the time that the Sierra Club raised the alarm before people were actually out of those trailers that had those elevated levels of formaldehyde. So in this case, we did interviews with FEMA director, David Paulson, with the deputy director, Johnson, with that Sierra Club volunteer that got all of this started in the first place. We looked at 10 different news stories, three journal articles, three FEMA press releases, the CDC guidelines, the National Cancer Institute's fact sheets, Department of Health and Human Services reports, testimony and hearings before the US Science and Technology Committee, final report to the Select Bipartisan Committee. And I rambled all that through to show multiple pieces of evidence, right? It's not just, oh, we read a bunch of news articles, so we wrote up a case study. You're pulling all these different pieces together so that you can then find those chain, that chain of evidence and make those connections. 
strengths, we found that FEMA had that established crisis network. They did partner with the CDC and the EPA. They did update their plan after formaldehyde was found. They created flyers in 13 different languages. And then uh, Paulson actually tried to foster an open relationship with the media. But there are so many things that didn't go well. One, they were completely unprepared to respond to formaldehyde. When it first came in, they're like, well, we're FEMA. We've covered disasters. We have no idea how much formaldehyde is supposed to be in a trailer or not. We're not responsible for trailers. We're not responsible for formaldehyde. So they kept passing the, back, the buck off to someone else. But just as an organization that has a recall, it doesn't matter where in the supply chain that or that crisis actually occurred, where the break in the supply chain occurred that caused the error, that caused the crisis, that caused the malfunction, all of that. It is who sold the final product. And in this case, FEMA distributed those trailers. Therefore, FEMA was ultimately responsible and they were held responsible, even though they had no control over how much formaldehyde was in those trailers. So they really struggled to communicate with compassion as well. There was no way for individuals to get complaints back up through the chain of command. They did release messages of self-efficacy as far as telling people to open their windows <laughs> uh, and air out their trailers, but the messages were far too late and they kept all of those individuals at risk for years past when they knew that it was detrimental to their health. The Tar Creek Superfund site, uh, <laughs> this case actually started back in 1979 when uh, mine water containing lead, zinc, and cadmium began to discharge out of the Tar Creek. This is in Oklahoma. And you can see in the background of the one picture on the top, those are chat piles. They are leftover remnants from mining in that area. And the middle picture there is the Tar Creek where you can see the orange from the cardmium that's coming up. They started getting sinkholes uh, throughout the area as well. It was labeled a super fund site. And what that means for those who aren't familiar with that language, uh, the EPA designates certain areas as super fund, which means that federal dollars can be allocated to um, fix the land is the best way to say it. Um, well, a way to say it. Uh, so they started cleaning up the area as a Superfund site. Well, then in 1993, they went in and did tests and they found that 35% of the children had elevated blood lead, le blood lead levels. And if you have elevated lead in your bloodstream, you are more likely to suffer from developmental disabilities and have a harder time concentrating. These are lifetime conditions that are caused by children being exposed to lead at an early age. So they started going in, they plugged a bunch of the wells in the area. And then in uh, 2008, <laughs> an EF4 tornado hit. And it spread all of that chat all back around the community. And they came in and said, look, we'll give you money to move, period. And that was it. There was no money to rebuild. There was no money to replace. You had money only if you relocated. So we looked at, for this case, we looked at the founder of LEAD, LEAD LED, and the little play on the words there that they created to really focus on the children in that area. And Rebecca Jim was the founder of that community organization. We looked at the news stories, journal articles, press releases, a whole line of uh, technical reports, as well as all of the public meeting transcripts and site records from the EPA. And then a lot of the communication that went back and forth as they were tracking these children and getting them into doctor's appointments and counseling along the line. They had networks in place. They were open and honest. Um, LEAD definitely provided compassion and they did accept the uncertainty of not knowing how many children would be affected and for how long but there was really a lack of attention to that public concern, lack of prompt response from EPA when those first tests came back. They didn't work with the media at all. You can see they wouldn't even do an interview with us and we got the money from the EPA to do the study and the EPA site coordinators wouldn't do interviews with us to study the case. Um, they failed to create messages of compassion and concern from the EPA where LEAD as a, a public agency came in to help. 
We also looked at the Tennessee Valley Authority coal ash spill. This was in uh, Tennessee, where in 2008, an earthen dike failed and essentially coal ash sludge flowed into the Emory River. And what they found was that they had actually gone through and done an inspection of the dike and the results of the, of the inspection that told them that they were weakened, that the dike was weak and was likely to break, that report came back two months after the spill. So they were doing the research, but it was too late for them to actually take action. And we looked at, we had an interview with the general manager of the Tennessee Valley Authority, looked at 11 news stories, press releases, again, multiple uh, pieces of evidence that we were looking at. They did listen to public concerns. This one was really interesting. So the sludge came down and as the trucks were going back and forth to be able to remove that sludge, people who lived in that area couldn't get to their mailbox because it was on the opposite side of the road. So TVA came in and moved all their mailboxes to the other side of the street so that they'd be able to get their mail without having to cross the road. So just little things that they did because they had a way to get those public concerns to them. They're accessible to the media, communicated concerns. So did a lot of things that were really great, but the plan that they had, their crisis plan was based on a nuclear power company. They didn't have a plan that was specific for the coal plant that they were operating. And um, they had some other issues with uncertainty, being honest about the amount of, amount of sludge that came out. They speculated a lot about how much they thought spilled and then they were wrong. So then they ended up looking bad in that, in that process as well. And then the last case that I'm sure everyone is familiar with, the, the BP oil spill, uh, starting off with the explosion of Deepwater Horizon, resulted in 11 deaths, 17 injuries, and 184 million barrels of oil in the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, we had 23 news stories, eight press releases from BP and all of their testimony. BP would not do interviews with us either. And interesting enough, this study was funded by the EPA. And most of the time, you can see this phase two of the study on the EPA's website, where you can find research these days on the EPA's website. But uh, this case study, this case study process never made it on there. And they said the only, reason, the only way that they would put it on there is if we took out the BP case and we didn't want to take out the BP case. So it's not on the website, which is fine. We just published it as a book chapter and wrote two other articles on it instead. But that was one of the, the challenges of this case. Uh, BP had a few strengths. They had established crisis partners, developed ways for the public to share concerns. If you remember, even famously, Kevin Costner provided a plan for how to collect the oil out in the Gulf of Mexico. There was the junk shot and the top hat and all those ideas that came in from the public. And they were really vigilant in revamping their plan following criticism. But the reason why there was criticism of their plan is because the plan that they had in the first place was for an oil spill off the coast of Alaska. And that was the plan that they filed with the mineral, mining and minerals uh, in order to drill in the Gulf of Mexico. And we put a stamp on it and we let them drill. Sorry, is this the case where, where the guy says that he wants his uh, his life back? Yep, that's why uh, uh, officials could have shown more compassion towards stakeholders. Yeah. Yes, when uh, Tony Hayward was uh, was talked to about the challenges, and he said he wants his life back. When of course eleven people died, and hundreds and hundreds were out of work and had lost their livelihood for years. Uh, in the fishing area. Uh, they also could have been more cognizant of those cultural differences, understanding, I mean, just understanding what the fishing industry is like in the Gulf of Mexico. They made these assumptions that there are all these big corporate companies who would have, you know, they could always get a loan and move forward. Well, many, many of the fisheries in that area are family owned. It is a guy with a boat. And that is the company and that is the livelihood for him and his family. So there's a lack of understanding of those cultural differences. They were virtually hostile to media sources. They piped in uh, video recordings showing the leaking uh, oil instead of actual live footage, even though they claimed it was live footage. So there are a whole lot of things that were weaknesses in this case. But again, when we finished with these five cases, 
now you know a lot about these cases and we still Jerry, haven't talked about it. Sorry. Yeah. Did the case where they threw Halliburton under the bus as well and they kind of blamed their their uh, partner instead of doing anything themselves? They did. Uh, they blamed Halliburton and Transocean. And the final report does note that Halliburton's cementing was off. Uh, however, it, BP, same thing as we just talked about with the, the other case, it was BP's oil well. You can blame the people along the line in the supply chain, your contractors, all you want. You are ultimately responsible. And the government ultimately held them responsible. So they ended up spending, uh, initially they thought it would cost them almost $20 billion. And instead it ended up costing them uh, about six, almost 70, am I doing that? $60 billion um, to be able to address those damages, the environmental fines and damages following the crisis. So after we finished with all of this, we really wanted to focus in on those lessons learned. So what happened? What can we learn from each of these cases? And then how could those be translated into the best practices? So for the Canadian Pacific Railway, safety and well-being of the affected should be a primary concern. I mean, that, that should, it shouldn't have to be a best practice. But as you can see for many of these cases, it wasn't a primary concern. The primary concern was finding out what spilled, what was the contamination, how big was the contamination and who's to blame. And the primary focus should have been on those who are exposed to the cloud and those who's, who will be carrying those respiratory challenges for the rest of their lives. And that's what the city should have done. And instead they congratulated themselves for a job well done on two and a half hours later, finding out that it was a derailment. Initial response affects the credibility of future response efforts. And that was key here because they did such a poor job at the beginning, no one trusted them by time they were dealing with the after effects of the crisis. Emergency alert systems and media outlets should be included in the establishment of the crisis network prior to the disaster. Any any company that is carrying any kind of chemical or anything that could hurt others should have a plan in place for what would they do if that leaked, if it spilled, if there was an explosion, how do you reach out to the community? How do you get that information out? You pose a risk to society, you have a responsibility to have a plan for addressing that risk. And that includes communicating with individuals about that risk need to be able to, um, and that was all with the, the Canadian Pacific Railway. With the travel trailers, we looked at the crisis response plans and making sure that they are evaluated for potential risk. So you're gonna bring these trailers in, what if something breaks in the trailer? And what Paulson and Johnson said is that they actually had a whole plan in place for what do you do when mold develops in the trailers? Because you know, it's an, a very wet area, very confined space. They had a plan for mold. Well, as we talked about earlier, having a plan and being able to go beyond the plan is really important. And when something came back that didn't fit into the plan, they were strapped and they were like, well, we don't handle formaldehyde. Well, you don't handle mold usually either. And you had a plan for that. So it's making sure that you understand those risks and having, having a plan in place for how to address them. Providing a venue for upward communication. So if people have complaints, they can get that to you. And they were very honest in our interviews. They said that there is really, in how things are set up with FEMA volunteers and Red Cross volunteers after a major disaster, if you tell a volunteer something, the chances of what you tell, of the chances that what you are telling them will actually get to someone who can make a decision is slim to none. So how do you get that upward communication so you know what's happening on the ground? Uh, poor previous crisis response compounds negative media coverage. So in some ways, very similar to that, that negative response at the beginning. So for FEMA, you had the response to Katrina. So now you add the formaldehyde trailers on top of it. We already don't trust them because of their initial response. And now they have another crisis. Culture is more than language and country of origin. This was 
key uh, in this case in that they were looking at, oh, we did a really good job. We printed the flyers in a lot of languages. They had checked the box for communicating with for cultural differences. They didn't look at how people communicated. They didn't look at how people moved within their family units. They didn't consider those who had never traveled out of their, their parish. And suddenly now they're put out in this field with all these other people they don't know in these trailers and how that changes the, di the dynamic and how they respond. So it's understanding that culture is more than language and country of origin. With the Tar Creek Superfund site, Prompt responses, follow throughs are critical. That's an obvious one and something that's built in. This one, if you've done any work looking or any research with Slavic's work on outrage factors, understanding that you harm children, those are one of those situational factors that has just changed everything about your ability to respond well. You have now harmed children for the rest of their lives. It really doesn't matter what else you do at this point. You are at their mercy. So you are finding ways to provide those support systems. Messages need to focus on how people can reduce their own harm. So providing, going back to that best practice of self-efficacy, but how do they reduce their own harm and make sure those messages are going out? So again, some of these fit with the best practices, some don't, but these were the lessons from each of the cases. TVA coal ash spill, crisis plans can't be copied, they must be tailored. During initial stages, you need to refrain from communicating exact figures. This is where they came out and they said, this is how much sludge is there. And then they were wrong. So then they were lying and they were hiding information. You need to make the recovery efforts known to the public and the affected community. This was a case where they were actually doing a ton and they didn't tell anyone. And then after they cleaned everything up, they didn't report what they actually did. So all of those pieces of the cleanup to show what they've done and how they fix things. So that now if something else happens at TVA, you pull the media and all you're gonna find is what happened with the spill. There isn't gonna be any media coverage in there about what they actually fixed because they didn't wanna talk about it anymore. So they didn't promote their response. BP, uh, similar to some of the others that we found, again, this is where there were connections, poor previous crisis response compounds that negative coverage. Again, culture is more than language and country of origin. Media accessibility is determined by the media. <laughs> they thought they did a great job because they sent out press releases and they built their own YouTube site and they had a whole area where people could get all the information. Well, the media wanted to get the information on their own because they didn't trust BP and there was a, a difference in understanding there. And then also same as uh, with TVA, crisis plans can't be copied. They must be tailored to that area. So as we take all of these lessons learned and we look back at the best practices, we took them and we ultimately decided to break things down into different areas. So first we looked at strategic planning. So plan ahead for a prompt response. That was there before as a best practice. Establish a crisis communication network. That was there before, before we had done this study and we found evidence of that throughout we added begrudgingly prioritize the safety and well-being of the public as a best practice because we found in multiple cases that they did not do that so if you are using these guidelines for your crisis planning for your crisis evaluation and you go back and you say are we prioritizing the safety and well-being of the public at least you're asking that question yes michael um, now, I taught students that, you know, 20 years ago, that was a fundamental mm -hmm. principle of crisis preparedness, and uh, that must be in the literature somewhere. But it wasn't in the best practices. <laughs> and that's why we ultimately decided we have to spell it out. I wonder what is the original title? Is it under the uh, EPA grant proposal on this case? case study what was the original title of it yeah oh um, it's kind uh, of uh yeah, how to handle was, the crisis from the government side or 
Uh, I can go back uh, at the beginning. It's it was a case study analysis, so environmental case case analysis and testing of an intentional intentional contamination event. So we had the grant was set up where we would do these five cases. We would go through the best practices. We would analyze them. We would then put them all together, make adjustments, and then we would take those best practices, put them together into uh, create vignettes of a fictional intentional contamination of the water supply. And then we would take those vignettes and then they went out into focus groups and we asked people about the difference between, so we would give them two different responses where one response would be um, messages that showed that they had that network so that they were relying on um, some, someone in the area of water safety that they were working with the local water company so that they could, we could show the communication network. And then in another area, we would compare that with, we did this as only that one institution and not showing that network. And then we ask them questions in the focus group about their level of trust of the organization and how they would respond to specific instructions on what to do based on the different type of vignette that they received for examination. Sherry, have you partnered with anyone that does simulations uh, research, uh, computer scientists who need you know, um, hu the human side of data to inform their models? Uh, I haven't specifically, but uh, Steve Vinette had uh, early in our work with the USDA, we had gone through and modeled uh, foodborne illnesses. So how long does it take? We looked at um, how the communication patterns came in and we looked at those models. We've also worked with the CDC for modeling and for tracking. So watching social media for um, uh, words that aren't necessarily scientific leading to explanations that you've received food poisoning. How's that? Uh, <laughs> so if people are tweeting about uh, their bathroom challenges or something along that line that you can pull those together and track them to then be able to model out whether or not there was a foodborne outbreak in that area. So uh, others have, I have not personally. Well, there's a story, I think, in the New York Times or something, or one of the major newspapers this morning about whether we can, uh, efforts to try to use things like Google data to try to track where COVID-19 is going to be hitting heavy next and other kinds of things, which is also been done. Yeah, and I think Ellis Cheng at uh, UC Davis just did a similar study to what Michael's talking about. Maybe it's about her research, I don't know, but um, where they that there is a better predictor of there's a spike in COVID numbers when people are looking for symptoms um, through their social media. So tweeting or what um, in China, this the research took place. So the what is it Weibo in China, I think, um, where they're essentially, I guess, weaving uh, as opposed to tweeting about looking for asking about symptoms in their social media sphere. And that gave that was a uh, an indicator before the actual numbers were in. So the social media can be quite a powerful predictor of certain things. Um, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, I mean, there's tons of opportunities for research in this area. It's just finding finding your interest area too. Uh, May I ask a quick okay. question? Yes, Anna. When you were talking about this, I had goose, goosebumps, really, maybe like five times or six times. My question is how, I mean, how do you stay objective? I guess, I guess, I mean, it is a question, but I mean, asking a researcher how do you stay objective, I guess that's not a good question. But I mean, how, how do you handle this? You know, how do you approach this? Uh, just so stressful. I mean, I still have those pictures and, 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 and kids and everything. Just, just you know, how, 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 what are the best practices to abstract from this? And um, in conducting the case study research, it all has to be based on the evidence. It is, I mean, you can, if you're going to add a critical bent onto it, you need to label that you are adding a critical piece on it. Um, the, the case study I'm working on right now, I, I honestly don't know what the answer should be. And I've done that in others too, because I base it on the evidence. And I, I had very strong opinions about that they were doing it wrong until I conducted the case study because the evidence told me that it's, there isn't a right answer 
that they are they are wrestling with something big and there are multiple perspectives and multiple narratives and what i'm doing in that case is bringing out those competing narratives so i'm i feel a little like the the cnn reporter who says well i guess we're gonna have to leave it there without actually drawing any conclusions but that's that's the conclusion of where it's at right now is that it's still up in the air in the the particular case i'm looking at but for me the being objective piece is that you are it is based on the evidence. If you have evidence to say they did it wrong, they did it wrong. But if they have evidence that they did things right, then give them credit for doing it right. It has to be based on the evidence. Sherry, from the perspective of your research, uh, what's the role uh, on, in, in these cases uh, of uh, social media in combating rumors? Because, be, be, because you had these cases where a lot mm -hmm. of population and community members were involved in this so so presumably there were a lot of rumors and uh, and fake news around and and so on uh there was and there wasn't so most of these cases are older um bp was um i would say tva and bp were the ones that were probably the newest ones uh, but even back to looking at hurricane katrina i mean we were still using chat boards for a lot of it. So we didn't have the proliferation of social media that we do now. So, and I mean, and even going back to the like Canadian Pacific in 2002, we didn't have any of this. Mm -hmm. So it's changed so much too. And what we're, we're looking at the evidence that is around at that time. So now when we're doing uh, different case studies, we're bringing in social media because that's part of the case evidence. And in these cases, uh, we didn't bring it in. It just wasn't as impactful. And if we weren't going to bring it in for one, we tended not to go that route with the others. And there was actually for the BP oil spill, um, there were two other papers that were written specifically about that case. And they, they took off and looked at social media just for a separate case. And that's even here, uh, Katie Anthony ended up, and I ended up doing a separate study just on the FEMA case and we went really in depth on that one because it was it was just really intriguing for us so you can that's one thing that's great too about doing these multi-case analysis is that you got a paper for each case <laughs> you can take a different perspective on each case you can put them all together in that multi-case analysis because there's so much there when you have all of that data and once you've collected all of that evidence so going through i uh, marine when i was talking earlier about keeping all of that evidence separate What's great about doing that, if you aren't just pulling it in automatically into an argument to build it for a certain paper and you keep the evidence separate, then when you change or decide to do something else with uh, different research questions, looking at it from a different theoretical perspective, you can then take that lens to that evidence and look at it with fresh eyes because you're keeping the evidence separate. So, which is also why you're able to publish more in these areas because you are you aren't reproducing the same study over and over. They are all new studies looking at the data from a different perspective. And in some cases, collecting more data like they did for the social media case. That's right. So uh, the next area that we decided to focus on is, and we spent a little bit more time on, was looking at the inclusive approach. We expanded this area. so. We already had that listen to public concerns that stayed in there and we saw how some of the lessons learned, learned could fit in those public concerns. But we decided to separate out uh, instead of just saying acknowledge and account for cultural differences to also add in to acknowledge and account for vulnerable populations. Because who is a vulnerable population may be different than looking at those cultural differences. So a vulnerable population may be children as in the case with Tar Creek. It may be an individual who is not on social media, someone who does not have a cell phone, someone who does not have their own vehicle to be able to evacuate. So there is a difference between vulnerable populations and where you have to account for those cultural differences. Often they are the same, right? Because those who are, especially when we're looking at minority populations are more likely to be vulnerable. Women are more likely to be vulnerable, but we wanted to separate them out so that we could really look at that difference because they weren't considering with the TVA case. Once you add children, that changed everything because they're a vulnerable population. 
We also, while it was in there before with listen to public concerns and forming partnerships, we specifically put in form partnerships with the public. So this is that focus on providing that upward communication from the, the ground level of a crisis up to those who can actually make decisions that if you are responding to a public crisis, you need to be partnering with the public so that you understand what's happening. So we made that more clear within the best practices. Meet the needs in the media and remain accessible. That was there from before. We just added a little bit more language to the description. Responsible communication. In this area, we left the accept uncertainty, but we added in and avoid public speculation. So part of the, with, like with the TVA case and actually with BP case as well, because they were making, they were speculating how much oil was being spilled. And again, they were wrong. So then they looked like they were lying. So we added accept uncertainty and avoid public speculation because the, the gut reaction is to, because you don't wanna accept that uncertainty that you speculate in order to reduce that anxiety and reduce the uncertainty, but that ends up hurting you even more. So we expanded out that best practice. Now, weren't they, weren't they speculating though? You said you look like you're lying, but, but I think it's pretty clear they were lying. You know, like those low numbers and the fake video footage and stuff were just attempts to cover their ass they were not doing it because of bad best practices. So, well, I would agree with that in the in the BP case. Right. At the same time, we had just finished um, the study on the Fukushima Dakai nuclear disaster. And in that case, TEPCO over speculated, they overestimated the amount of nuclear contamination, which caused additional uh, panic, well, I hate to say panic when I'm talking about crisis, caused an additional anxiety uh, over what was happening in that area. So again, they were trying to speculate to reduce that uncertainty. They were wrong. It didn't help them in any way, shape, or form. So we added that piece. For the area of, um, before it said provide for self-efficacy, what does that mean for a practitioner was probably the biggest thing for us. So we put it in, especially after looking at all of the work that the cell nows had done, looking at instruction in crisis response, and even some of the work that tied in with the NCFPD, where we were providing instructional messages on how to protect yourself from uh, food contamination. So we made that adjustment to that best practice to specifically say provide instruction for self-protection. Uh, another one that we added in there, as before we were talking about acknowledging and accounting for vulnerable populations and for uh, cultural differences, you then need to tailor the messages to those affected audiences. Not just the words that you use, but how you send it out. You need to be sending those messages out through the modes of communication that are used by those publics who are being affected. So we added that one into the best practices. We made no changes about communicating with honesty or communicating with compassion. That was there. It's still really, really hard for organizations to do in a crisis. Under corrective action, it was already there to continuously evaluate and update crisis plans. So even though both TVA and BP failed on that account, it's still a best practice, but there was no change to it. But we did add in to complete and communicate recovery efforts. So that post-crisis, you can go back and tell them what you've done, how you fixed it. Don't pat yourself on the back, but demonstrate what you've done to be able to address those concerns and to prevent a similar crisis from occurring in the future. And we actually, as we brought this one out, it was interesting because we had done the, oh, the peanut butter paste contamination crisis uh, by that point. And uh, we had done a comparison of the three big peanut butter brands and Peter Pan that according to um, situational crisis communication, they had had a past crisis. They should have actually done worse in that crisis, but because they had just had a salmonella case, their entire website was built out about all of their safety procedures they invited the media to come in and tour their plant. They had all of this media coverage about everything that they did to make sure that it couldn't happen again. And then, and it really wasn't a direct threat for them anyway, but they came out much better than uh, GIF did fine because it was just really big. 
but they came out better than Skippy because they had so much um, of that recovery effort documented. So even as we are going through these cases, you know, we are doing a case analysis just on these environmental cases, but we had spent so many years doing all these food safety cases where when we came to this one, we're like, oh yeah, that fit over here too. So it's kind of that resonating where we were having those discussions with everyone who's working on the case analysis that we could bring in those other examples too. Regarding, uh, I have a one question, Sherry, before we go to the next slide. Yes, some of the cases is very live whenever the accident, uh, the current and then your interview is going on simultaneously. So it's kind of very real story like sketch right out there. I just wonder the you highly emphasize on evidence and collections of all the live stories. So how much is value the case studies when you collect in the on the on the site and then use it as a kind of as a next paper whatever yeah so what i what i typically do is gather all the um the text evidence first so i was mentioning the case study i'm working on right now gathered all of the the news coverage all of the press conferences all of the press releases all of that first did an initial summary of the case and then i set up my interviews and that's what we did in these cases too, so that we were really using those interviews to check ourselves, to check our analysis of the case. Mm -hmm. Double sure check. Was, mm -hmm. Right, to make sure that the assumptions that we were making based on the evidence we had at that time rang true for those who were in the crisis. And to me, that's the importance of those interviews. It wasn't necessarily that we were collecting data in order to you know figure out how things were going we had already collected the big chunk of data and prepared that initial case summary and then we conducted the interviews for that for that check back with what actually happened during the crisis so you see is there any concern regarding some sort of bias people so much observed on current issues and event probably is too much uh, exaggerate their negative comment or sentiment during your interview or how can I, we uh, make us kind of neutralize the parts yeah so i bring it in as it is their perspective so when i'm doing when i'm doing case studies i i can only think of a couple times where the the individual was anonymous Usually, if I if I have to go through IRB approval, so sometimes it depends on the university. Because if you're doing a case study in some in some universities, they see that the same as you would be doing a media and um, coverage of it, so they don't make you go through IRB. Others do, and even when I go through the IRB piece, I I put through for them to not uh, be anonymous because I am asking their opinions and for information based on the position they held at the time of the crisis. So I wouldn't, I wasn't interviewing Paulson as a human, I was interviewing the former director of FEMA. So everything he was contributing is from his perspective there. So his title's in there, his name is in there. So if it comes back, cause I would go through and I would talk about a media controversy, for example, that occurred um, where they, uh, FEMA was going to do a press conference, they invited the media on, and then they muted all of the media, provided their statement, and didn't open it up for questions. And Paulson was furious, and he fired the person who set up the conference call. But then he could provide that perspective because he was there. That's fine. He was convinced that he provided a great relationship with the media, but because the rest of his team didn't, it didn't matter. So the media saw them as untrustworthy. So it allows for that contradiction. It's okay for me looking at that because that's just another piece of evidence. It can be contradictory evidence, but it's still helping us understand what was happening at that time. Right, thank you. Yeah. So ultimately uh, what we finished at the end of this study was putting together these essential guidelines. So now we can take these guidelines, the updated guidelines, and be able to take them back out, do crisis communication training. So the whole road show that we did the first time around with the best practices, it is to go back out and test these other best practices. Do people see them? 
Does it fit? Are there things that you can do from a crisis planning standpoint that would engage all of these different guidelines? And to me, it's so funny. Some of these are sometimes when I talk about theories, especially grounded theories, I call them duh theories, like, well, duh, you should be open and honest, right? But we have to put them in there because otherwise people don't do the assessment. They don't do part of that planning process of making sure that they are checking those boxes. And yes, it is checking boxes, but the alternative is they don't. So, <laughs> I mean, it's a, it, it provides a nice guidance for us when we're going out and doing consulting, we can bring these guidelines in and say, all right, this is what's important when you are responding to a risk or a crisis. We can go through and do exercises with them. So we've done that with uh, local emergency management where they went through an exercise. Um, I just moved from Kentucky and we have the chemical weapons stockpile there. So we go through, you could have an exercise. That would be a case where then you could do an assessment of your response in that exercise as to whether or not you followed those best practices so that you're always hitting back in those different areas so that when the crisis does occur you're not getting out the guidebook you're not checking the box you are reacting because you know what needs to be done and that's really the focus that you are following those best practices that hopefully by that time are so ingrained that you know that it's something you need to follow you don't have to go and check the box So that is uh, the overview of that first part of the study. And I'll, we'll come back to the questions here in a second, but just to go back, what happened after this? We finished all of that. We had those recommendations. We then moved on. Uh, we partnered with the Northern Kentucky Water District uh, to do interviews and focus groups in the area. We took those best practices, compared them as strategy options, message vignettes, during and after a decontamination clearance phase. Um, and I was, I think I was on a different project by then. I wasn't involved in the interviews or the focus groups on any of this piece of it. So really I was just hearing the responses, what they were finding and being able to provide feedback. I will tell you to me that one of the most interesting findings of this is the, uh, the instructions for self-protection uh, in particular, they did focus groups of uh, a population of immigrants from West African countries, primarily that all live in kind of this one community in uh, Northern Kentucky. And they, they provided those messages for instruction and it was boil water, you know, don't drink those kind of instructions. And they're like, this is America, the water's safe. And that was it. It was such a different uh, perspective that we wouldn't have had had we not gone to a different population. So that's the importance of, of checking these messages again with different cultural communities, their understanding of the world. It can't just be, this is the way it is and this is how it's gonna work, what works and what doesn't work. You still have to adjust for those cultural differences too. So going back to uh, the discussion as we wrap up here, is grounded theory Real theory? I know, Michael, you did theory last month, right? Was that yours last month? Is grounded theory real theory? Are the best practices theory? You're asking me or anybody? Sure, I'm asking anybody, but I'll, I'll pick on you since you presented last week. Well, I think it is, but I think it's done badly by a lot of people. And what you described, and so in some ways, you're describing a case study. And I think, like you said, most case studies are sort of, oh, look, here's what this company did. And you report on what a bunch of newspaper articles tell you. And you just use it as an example to try to illustrate what it is you're talking about, as opposed to studying this incident and this um, situation as a way to learn something about the actual theory here in this case. You're not studying BP to learn about what BP did. You're studying BP to learn about better communication practices. And I think that's where the emphasis needs to be, which is what you've said. Others? I'd say grounded theory builds theories. Um, so I, I would count <laughs> best practice as a theory. Um, I, think, I think, yes, um, 
it explains the phenomenon, you know, from the definition, explains the phenomenon, tells what you need to do and, and what's going to happen if you don't do this. So I would definitely count it as a theory. <laughs> Maureen poked her head in. Did she have an opinion and then decided not to give it? No, no, no. I, I hold on. I am getting ready to head out the door. So uh, I actually think yes, it is. I wouldn't have said yes before this presentation. So for me, the big <laughs> takeaways is that you're using case studies to inform theory. So that's unlike what most people are doing. Most people are using a case study to see, oh, they use this strategy to communicate with people. So I like that what you do is you bound a, a context and then you draw the theory out of it. And then because you're looking at best practices, that's what Maria sort of started this presentation. When she came in, she said, there's nothing as practical as a good theory. Good bow on the end of it. <laughs> so you were trying, oh, go ahead. No, I'm saying you tied it back to the beginning. And was able to give a shout out to Dorfel. <laughs> But don't you think for the theory we need more evidence from from other from other areas, not not only from this environmental stuff, because there are plenty of crises and they uh, so something which work there don't don't necessarily work work here. And that's that's the challenge of the best practices. Can they can they stand up outside the context? So that second question: Should best practices remain context bound? But if you look back at the guidelines, mm -hmm. is there any organization or entity who should not plan ahead to be able to provide a prompt response in a crisis? Mm -hmm. What what about what what about relationship with how say? Uh, link, linkage with uh, Tim Coombe's uh, situational crisis communication theory. But uh, so, how, how, how do you, you define what uh, what what what's the difference? What uh, I don't know, like linkages or so on. What? what yeah. You know? So actually, uh, Coombe's uh, theory comes in with uh, when we were talking before about one. If you have had a crisis before and you had a poor response to it, you have that compounding effect. That actually came directly from uh, situational crisis communication theory. The study that I mentioned uh, that Katie and I worked on specifically on the FEMA case, we brought in SCT, SCCT to make that linkage to those best practices. So the importance of responding right the first time, how you respond differently if you've had a past crisis already, which lines up with that crisis history of SCCT. So, they, it also makes it um, a little more valuable too in seeing how theories that are well-respected and represented in the literature can also link into what we're doing here with uh, the best practices. I think you also, um, I think I see this as the grounded theory piece is how you build up this list, right? And. And then you're recommending others take it up. And so it then transforms and becomes intervention and hypo hypothesis, right? And so I think through that process of developing, then implementing, and then getting feedback on those implementations is how we can start to see the ways in which the, um, the theory cascades across these different contexts and different situations as well. And it, it does make me think about um, AUKUS and Jackson and others and their design theory and you know and in some ways you know what you saw here in terms of organizations doing these things in in live time was you were revealing their own theories of communication design and what they think is necessary and needed and then you know extracting out from a collection of cases you're able to then turn that back around so I very much see this as really robust theory building. It doesn't have the same machinations of the, you know, the uh, middle uh, 20th century ex controlled experiments of Kurt Lewin, if right. bring it 
him, right? But, you know, it doesn't have those machinations, but we've also transformed intellectually and grown as social scientists to recognize that just because there's a lab coat and a controlled experiment doesn't mean that it that it's it's something other than theory building. The, we have best practices in everything. I mean, so I think it would be silly for anyone to try to argue that we shouldn't have them. I mean, we've had best practices in every field in the world, best practices in accounting, you know, best practices in business, best practices in everything. You'd be a fool not to recognize that you should be starting from the best practices. But I think what you do point out here is that this takes us farther. You know, it lets us refine the best practices and make them more robust and make them more dynamic. But if you're not starting from best practices as a communicator, you're gonna fail. I mean, you're, you're clearly not taking the right approach. And for those doctoral students on the line, you are welcome to take all of these and test them and apply them <laughs> and cite them. <laughs> I absolutely encourage others to take it and see whether or not it stands up. I mean, that's kind of, that's what we've been doing for the last 10 years, oh, oh, for the last 15 years is taking these best practices and applying them and testing them and see what works and what doesn't work. But the key thing is that going back to the point of all of this is that we are trying to learn about communication. We are not trying to learn about the case. The case comes in very insightful, very helpful, very instructional, but the purpose is to better understand communication. So if you write a case study and I end up reviewing it, which I end up reviewing a lot of case studies because it's my research area, I, I will often send comments back saying, I learned a lot about this case. I learned nothing new about communication. And if we're not learning anything new about communication, then why are you sending it to a journal? You can send a, a case study like that for a nice example for a book chapter somewhere or a teaching case study in your classes. I just think it would be so interesting to look at it from the cultural perspective, just what best practices are for different countries. We have so many issues in Russia happening. And, you know, right now we have like four or five cases of environmental crisis just in the last couple of months just and the communication is horrible i mean i don't I, I, maybe we can come up with a theory like wor worst practices i mean that's <laughs> something we can definitely do so i think it'll be very interesting to see how it plays out in the cultural context yeah i don't know if you'll be able to get those interviews <laughs> to be able to do the data check but yeah, sure all the people are hard to get <laughs> All right, I'm um, going to apologize because I've never had to try to wrap one up prematurely, but we have a we have to get going. I would like to uh, thank everybody who's come here for the first time and thank Sherry for doing this. And um, also, I'd like to say um, when we're finished, if you could review, I, I didn't hit start to like two minutes in because I was just you know listening to you and I got so enthralled. Uh, if you could maybe just run your first three or four slides. Again, just so they're on the uh, recording, I, I'll put it in the notes. If somebody wants to catch them, they can catch them at the end. But I want to thank you. And you know, I thought this is very excellent discussion. I think as Maureen said, something will make our students watch. Awesome, thank you. This has been really fun. I'm a Dean now, so I don't get to play in research very much anymore. <laughs> so this was like a joyful experience for me. It, was, it would be more fun if we could be drinking beer afterwards though. I actually had my drinks with the Dean beforehand. So my glass of wine has been sitting here the whole time, but I'm thinking, oh, Maria, yours is empty. It was full. <laughs> now, I saw that get refilled a couple of times, Maria. Did... Only one, only one oh. glass. <laughs> <laughs> All, All right. right, well, thank you very much. Cheers. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, and I'm going back to the beginning for you. Yeah, if you could just, Put them on for a few seconds. Somebody can always pause the tape. Sure. They, want. they can see your sites that you had there and that sort of thing. Yeah, so best practices, agenda. I was just talking here. So I the next nice talk about those later. So here, first grant that we were working on, pubs that came out of that one. And again, these are only mine. There are tons more that were with others on the grant that were not part of, just aren't on my Vita. This is the big one that came out, those best practices. Um, I didn't get a lot of pubs because I was traveling around testing them out. You're a dean now, it doesn't matter. Yeah. <laughs> Grabbing in social media.
small contract on a bigger grant. And then the big five-year grant that we got to look at a ton of different case studies and start testing all of this out and looking at different perspectives. Okay, uh, to, this is the grant, uh, the question earlier, uh, community engagement and case analysis was the name of the grant uh, that we actually looked at here that came from the EPA. Okay, and, and I probably started by then. I started about three minutes late, so I think you were you probably were back before this, but I just thought we'd have them available so that uh, they could be on the recording. Perfect. All right, well, thank you. It was nice having you, getting to see you again. Thank you. Hopefully we'll see you soon. All right. Thanks a lot, everyone. Thank you, everybody, for being here. Bye. Okay, I'm going to end this. Thanks.